We can bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this day. Thank you for the many blessings you've given us, Lord. <coughs> we thank you, Lord, for grace, mercy, for the fellowship that we have with the saints. 
We pray, Lord, this morning for our brother Steve, who had surgery and is recovering well. We pray for our sister Norma, Lord, that you'd be with her, bless her, give her peace. Help her, Lord, to be strong. And we also pray this morning, Lord, for our brother Harvey's daughter, Karen, who's battling cancer. We just pray, Lord, that you'd restore her strength. Just bless her heart, Lord. Help her to know you, your grace and love. And we pray for today's service, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts, Lord. Reveal yourself through the message. We pray blessing for Pastor John and for the elders for all that they do. And we thank you in your son Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. I am going to read this morning from Colossians 1. Me. Starting at verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and had translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Amen. This morning, we're gonna do things a little different. Let's stand now and praise the Lord.
may be seated. Today's announcements. Passage Prayer and Praise Night will be Thursday, March 22nd at 7 p.m. All are welcome to attend, as well as those you may know who may, may be in need of prayer. Gather together with the family and have your prayers heard. Grace Christian Fellowship Youth Ministry, our ministry for the youth ages 9 through 16, will be meeting on Saturday, March 31st, from 5 to 7. We ask to encourage all our youths to attend this time of, to bond and fellowship with one another, with Bible challenges, activities, fun, and prizes. For more information, please see our sister Jackie or Brother Rodney. Men's ministry will be Friday, March 23rd at 7 p.m. All men are welcome to attend. Women's ministry will be Tuesday, March 30th at 6.30 p.m. All ladies are welcome to attend. And as I said in the beginning, please keep our brother Steve Panulo in prayer he had emergency surgery this week. He's doing well. He's recovering. Our sister Norma, and please pray for Harvey's daughter who's suffering from cancer. One other announcement. This week, Andrew and Jamie celebrated the birthday of their son Ezra, his second birthday. One other announcement, for those of you that are not aware, we still have a continuing building fund. We're thankful for all of you that give regularly, but this fund is to repair stained glass windows, air conditioning, padding the pews, and many other things. So if you would like to donate, just take one of the offering envelopes and put your donation in it and put on it special offering and put what you want to donate for. You know, it can go into just the renovation fund or for the padding of the pews or for the air conditioning. Uh, and if you'd like to know what all the needs are, you can speak to Mike or Craig and they can let you know that. And with that said, children may now be dismissed for classes. Oh, and also, today is Coffee Inn. So you're welcome after service to join for fellowship, coffee and pastry. And with that said, it's my pleasure to introduce our pastor, Pastor John Ritchie. Okay, praise God. It's good to be here. No better place to be on Sunday morning except in what? Church with God's people, amen? Do we have any first-time visitors today? First-time visitor? If you're a first-time visitor, raise your hand. Oh, all veterans today. Very good. All right, I'd like you to take your Bible, and I want you to turn me to Exodus chapter 2. And let's bow our heads. We'll go to prayer. Exodus chapter 2. Father, this morning we're so grateful and so thankful to be able to have this opportunity once again to be with the people of God, meeting to the name of our risen Savior, the Lord Jesus, around the Word of God. And our Father, this morning I pray that as we go to your Word that you would open our hearts and challenge our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that in this time that we spend in your Word, fellowshipping with you, 
I pray that we'd lay aside all our cares, all our burdens, all our responsibilities, and that this would be a time of focusing totally upon you, fellowshipping with you in the word. And I pray that you would challenge our hearts from the things we're about to note and study, that we might be able to continue to grow and become the disciples that you want us to be. And Father, I pray this morning that I could speak with wisdom, with grace, with humility, with conviction and passion. I pray that I could speak with the authority that your word deserves. And I pray today, Father, that I could take the knowledge that you have given me on this subject and make it clear and accurate and understandable that your people may be blessed and become doers of the word, not just hearers. And I pray if there be anyone within the sound of my voice this morning that is not saved, pray that you would convict them of their sin and of their need of Jesus Christ, that they might believe upon him and receive the forgiveness of sins and eternal life through faith in his name. And I ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 2, and I want to begin. We're going to begin in verse number 18. We're looking at Moses' life, we're in part nine, we're talking about handling being alone with God, God's grace in a desert place. Before we begin reading at verse 18, I want to just remind you now, Moses has fled to Midian, and he sat down by a well, and then some women came to water their father's flocks, and they were given some trouble by some shepherds, but Moses stood up for them, and he defended them and basically enabled them to take care of watering their flocks. And that's where we are in our story at this point. Moses has stood up and helped these women. Now, you've got to remember, Moses is going to spend the next 40 years of his life on the backside of the desert. It's not the life that he was used to. It's not the life that he would have chosen for himself. Moses was raised in the palace. He was used to the finest things. He was used to enjoying all the pleasures that life could offer and afford. He was being groomed to become the next pharaoh of Egypt. But he made a choice, the greatest decision in life, to choose to suffer with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And the Bible says it's because he esteemed the riches, the reproach of Christ greater than the riches of Egypt. And the Bible says he endured as seeing him who is invisible. The invisible things that God promised in his word were more real to Moses than the actual physical material things that he had experienced and could see in this world. And he made this great decision and it led him to a hard, difficult place. He was now a fugitive from justice. And he was in a place where he was going to be humbled on the backside of the desert, living a shepherd's life, which to an Egyptian was the most lowest scum of the earth job that you could possibly have being a shepherd. But this is God's chosen place to prepare Moses for promotion in life. He's going to be on the backside of the desert. He's going to be at Ruel's house, who's also known as Jethro. And he is going to be there because that's God's school to educate Moses, to train Moses in God's ways, to prepare Moses for what God has prepared for him. And the principle we noted is this. Wherever you are in your life, whatever your circumstances, I want you to understand that God has not forgotten you. God has a plan for you. You may have failed miserably like Moses had. Uh, and you may be in a circumstance you say, well, how could God ever use me? How could God ever bless me? I want you to understand this. Do not despise the place and the circumstances where you are today because that is God's plan and that is where God has placed you. And that's God's place that he has ordained to prepare you and train you for promotion and blessing 
in service, in usefulness in the future. Are you with me today? You have to understand this. Now, look at verse number 18 to 21 in Exodus, and let's read. Verses 18 to 21. And when they came to Ruel, whose name means friend of God, he was a believer. God ha had prepared a place for the fugitive Moses to go, and it was a believer's house. You have to understand, Moses is going out from Egypt, and he's got no money, no career, no friends, no family, no opportunity, no options. And he's all alone, and all he has is who? God. But God is going to be faithful. God had already foreseen all this, and long before, God had prepared a place and a circumstance where he would send Moses to equip Moses, to train Moses, and to prepare Moses for the task that God had for Moses to accomplish. And it says in verse 18, and when he came to Ruel, their father, these are the the girls that came to water the flocks, Ruel's daughters, he said, how is it that ye are come so soon today? So Ruel asked him, why are you back so quickly? Usually it takes you a lot longer to water the flocks. And they said, an Egyptian, speaking of Moses, delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and also drew water enough for us and watered the flock. And he said unto his daughters, and where is he? Why is it that he, ye have left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. So he, he's very impressed that this man, Moses, has helped his daughters, and uh, he wants to honor him. He says, hey, go get him, bring him in, and let's sit down and eat and break bread with him. He, Moses gains an immediate acceptance into Ruel's what? Family, his house. He aided Ruel's daughters. Ruel was a man who knew how to repay a what? A favor. He respected what Moses did. He helped his daughters. And so he invites them in. And all of this is no what? Accident. This is what we call divine what? Providence. This is God's intervention on the behalf of his people for his what? Purpose in our lives in time. So Moses is not at Ruel's house by accident. He's there by divine appointment. God had brought him there. And look at verse 21. And it says, And Moses was content. Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses Zephorah, his daughter. So now we see that God provides the fugitive who has no place to lay his head, who has no job, who has no family, he has no friends. He has an uncertain future ahead of him. He really doesn't have any opportunities on the horizon or any options for his life. God provides him with a wife, a home, friendship, family. His needs are all being what? Met. And this is God's logistical grace because the scripture tells us, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, your needs, will be added unto you. David said in Psalm 37, 25, I have never seen the righteous forsaking or his seed begging for bread. And the amazing thing is here's Moses going out of Egypt leaving everything behind leaving a fabulous, fantastic life of wealth and power and luxury and pleasure and prominence behind, going out with nothing to an uncertain future, crossing a vast desert, and he lands in Midian, and he sits down by a well, and here comes Ruel's daughters. God had arranged it, what, all. And you know, many times we can go through hardships in life and, and pain and suffering and failure, Failure. Moses, he had to feel shame and, 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 and discouragement and failure because he thought he was going to deliver the Hebrews and he didn't. By killing the Egyptian, he only made things, what, worse. And he compounded problems for himself. And he must have been very discouraged and very down. And 
Many times in life we get to a place where we feel like, wow, what a dead end. I, I failed miserably. And we don't realize that with God, failure is the back door to success. Did you hear that? Failure is the back door to success. The bird with the broken wing in the grace of God can be healed and fly higher than he or she ever flew before. This is encouraging because God is not going to abandon Moses. God has a plan for Moses. I want to tell you today, God has a plan for your life. And, you know, you may be in a place where you feel like, wow, it's, I, I, I failed, I've messed up, uh, I'm discouraged. And yet here's the point I want you to understand. God has already foreseen your circumstance and he has already arranged logistical grace provisions to meet your needs wherever you are at. Do you hear me today? God has already arranged a provision and a place to provide for your needs. Now, Moses is going to get his needs provided for, okay? But you've got to understand something. He's crossed this desert. He's got a lot of questions on his mind about his future. There's all this uncertainty. And uh, he couldn't see the future, but God in faithfulness did. And God had prepared a place for him. Now, I want you to understand something. God, when you decide to get right with him, you can have the ultimate confidence that God is going to take care of you. Do you understand? There was a lot of uncertainty here. Moses must have been troubled in his soul about a few things, quite a few things. But he crosses the desert and he comes to this place that God has prepared for him. And it's a place that God has prepared to meet Moses' needs. I want to give you a principle. I want to give you a principle. I'm going to put it up on the on the screen. When you choose to obey God, serve him, seek him, and say no to what the devil in the world offers, and you choose to walk by faith, God will take care of you. You understand that? You may be in a place where you say, I don't know what the future is going to be from this point. It seems like I've, I, I've met a dead end. I, I've failed. Uh, life hasn't been what I thought life would be. I haven't been able to achieve what I thought I could achieve. Uh, it hasn't gone the direction that I would have wanted it to. But I want you to understand something. God is in control. And God will never give up on you. Do you understand that? God will never give up on you. Moses failed terribly, and yet God is going to provide everything that Moses needs in grace so that Moses can be prepared and equipped for fantastic promotion and blessing. Even in the midst of his failure, God has not abandoned him, but in matchless grace, God goes ahead of him and prepares a place, and he provides a home and security and a job as a shepherd and a wife and even has a family. And God is meeting his what? Needs, his logistical grace provision so that Moses can be equipped and trained and prepared to become the man that God wants him to be so that God can bless him and use him. Now, relate that to your own life. Relate that to your own life. No matter where you've been or what you've been through, no matter what your circumstances may be, and you might be frustrated with your circumstances, uh, and you might say to yourself, gee, I just passed it. Just, life just has not gone the way that I would have wanted it to go. I want you to understand this. Listen, the last chapter has not been what? Written yet. You see? The last chapter has not been written. And I want you to understand something else. Wherever you are at, if you will get right with God, and if you will seek God, and if you will execute God's plan, and if you will learn his word, 
and apply it to your life, God, God is going to provide all your needs and God is going to prepare you and train you and equip you for a time in your life where he's going to promote you and bless you and use you for his purposes. Do you understand this this morning? This is the story of Moses' life, that out of failure he rises from the ashes of failure to be what? Useful to God and to be blessed fantastically by God. And it says here, but something's going to happen before that can happen. We've got to realize that God's going to take care of us. Things may not look great today. We get a lot of questions and a lot of things unanswered and there's a lot of uncertainties. But to realize, you know what? God's going to provide our needs. And obviously, you know, what God provided for Moses in Ruel's house on the backside of the desert was not the type of accommodations that he was used to. You know what I'm saying? Moses was, was used to being treated like what? Royalty. Moses was used to living in the palace. Moses was used to having uh, servants wait on him hand and foot. Moses was used to commanding you know, authority over people. You see? And he was used to the best things of life. And now he's going back to the backside of the desert and God's going to meet his needs, but it's not going to be the same kind of provision that he was used to. Now, let me say something to you. When God chooses to provide for you in your circumstances, he may not give you the accommodations that you are used to. See, and this is where a lot of Christians fail because they don't understand that God's trying to humble you. You know, maybe you've been through a failure. And now you realize, I can't have everything that I used to have. But God's still going to provide for you. You see? God's still going to provide for you. Will you be content as Moses was? It tells us here that Moses was content to dwell there. In other words, he resigned himself to humbly accept the circumstances. And that's the first step in getting with God's program, is accepting that my life may not be what it used to be or what I would want it to be, but I'm willing to accept whatever God's provision is for me now. Wherever he places me, whatever he gives me, it's his grace providing my needs. And if I will be content to dwell in God's provision and to thank him for it and to execute his plan and to trust him step by step, God will lead me out to something better. But humility comes before what? Honor. Humble thyself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you or promote you in what? Due season. The right what? Time. And God may be slow, but he's always right on time. Amen? So, in your life, can you accept where God's placed you? And can you realize, yeah, you know, it's been a failure. It hasn't been what it should have been. It ain't what I would have chose for myself. It's not what I want for my life right now, but this is where God has me, and I am going to be content to dwell in God's provision, whatever that provision is at the moment. Are you hearing me? Maybe I was used to driving a Cadillac and eating filet mignon and having a, 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 a beautiful home. Now God says, well, you got that little apartment over there and you have that beat up old Ford truck and uh, you're going to eat rice and beans. But guess what? You got a roof over your head, you got transportation, you got food in your belly, God's provided. And if you can be content to accept that circumstance and persevere and execute God's plan, your day of blessing and promotion will come. Are you hearing me this morning? Okay. Now, Moses becomes becomes content. And, and here's the awesome thing. When you decide to serve God, he's going to take care of you. 
but he doesn't say that he's going to give you everything that you would prefer. You may not get the accommodations you're used to, but he's going to take care of you. Are you with me? And uh, so Moses becomes content. He, he accepts the circumstance that he's in. And you've you got to realize, for a man like Moses, a man of what? Great learning, great intelligence, great oratory skills, physical strength and stamina, and power and authority and a commanding presence. This is a humbling place. He's going to go back on the backside of the desert and he's going to what? Take care of sheep. Right? Alone with God. So Moses resigned himself to the simple, quiet, humble life of a shepherd and a family man. It wasn't going to be exciting as all the parties that were in the what? Palace. He wasn't going to be meeting all the dignitaries from all over the world who came with gifts and stories. There wasn't going to be wine, women, and song anymore. He wasn't going to have, you know, his stable of beautiful chariots. You know, I paid 100 grand for that one and 75 for that. And look at this one. No. He's going to carry a shepherd's staff and walk where he has to go. Maybe he's got a mule to ride now and then. Do you understand? Things have changed. But he is content to dwell there. His life is now going to become a stock contrast to what it was when he was in Egypt. The prestige, the pleasure, the life of wealth and power, that is all a long gone memory. And so Moses settles down. And he's going to be there for 40 years on the backside of the desert in the land of Midian. You say, why 40 years, Pastor? Well, all I can say is this. Moses was a very strong-willed, powerful, capable, resourceful, stubborn man. And God had a great task for him. So to break and mold and humble Moses into what he wanted him to be was going to require some time. Uh, you know, if you look over in verse 23, I just like this part it says, and it's referring to as time passed. It says, and it came to pass in the process of what time? Note that. The process of what time? How do we change? Change does not come in a split second or a moment. We often in emotion think, oh yeah, you know, God spoke to me, I got it, I figured it out. And we think all of a sudden we're changed. No, we're not. Do you ever get to a place in life where you, 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 things got, might have got tough or difficult and hard and you came to that epiphany of, yeah, I, it's, this is all because I've been living wrong and doing the wrong thing and, and I ain't been right with God. And that's why this has happened. All right, Lord, I figured it out, I got it. And you think just because you got it that you've really changed. And that tomorrow or next week, God's just going to flip the switch and fix everything for you and change your life. And then you notice time keeps going by. Day after day, week after week, month after month, sometime year after year. And why? Because real change is a slow process of time. Real lasting change. We don't know ourselves as good as God knows us. We think, oh yeah, it was painful, it was hard. Lord, I got right, I know what I did wrong, I'm, I'm done with that, I'll be different now, just fix this, Lord. No. God knows us better. That's emotion. That's just emotion. That's not real deep growth and change. And that's wanting relief from the pressure. So God says, no, you stay there and you deal with the pressure, and, uh, but I'll take care of you. I'll provide all your needs. It might not be what you're used to, but I'll take care of you. And there's this process of what? Time. Because change for most people comes very what? Slowly. If there's one thing we don't like as human beings, it's what? Change. We like what we know. We like what's familiar. We like what's comfortable. We're all the same way. Listen, I'm that way, you're that way. We're all that way. So God puts us in this place, and it's going to take time. And here's Moses, a very strong, powerful man. Now, 
You say, what's God's timetable for, for my process? Well, I don't know. But I'll tell you this, the more you fight God, the longer it will what? Be. The more you grumble and gripe and complain and murmur and resist what God is trying to do in your life, the longer and the harder the process will be. Amen. Nobody wants to say amen to that, huh? Nobody wants to say amen to that, right? That's what's going to happen, folks. And listen, but here's the good news. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. Do we have that up there, Craig? Yes. Here's the good news. Look what that says. God is what? Faithful. By whom you were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's the good news. God is faithful. And I want you to know something today. God's faithfulness to you and me does not depend on our faithfulness to him. The Bible tells us even when we're unfaithful, he remains faithful what? Still. The scripture says in, I believe it's Hebrews chapter 13. Do we have that on, on there, Craig? Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Hebrews 13, 5. And 13, 5 and 6. If we could put it up on the board. Oh. There we go. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he had said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. There's an unconditional promise to God. The moment that you believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior, God declared you righteous. He justified you. You were justified by faith without the works of the law, the Bible says. And he justified you and declared you righteous, and he gave you his righteousness. And now you're in Christ, accepted in the beloved, you belong to God forever, and because you possess his righteousness, not your own righteousness, because your own righteousness is filthy rags, but you possess God's righteousness, God's character, he will now always be faithful to you, even when you're unfaithful to him. Do you understand that? So Moses messed up, but did God give up on him? No. He said, now did he say, well, we're going to get some chastening here because you've got to be taught some things, Moses. But in grace, he went ahead. He went ahead of Moses, and he what? Prepared a place for Moses. And he said, now this is the place, Moses. It's not what you're used to, and it's not what you would want for your life at this point, but it's what I want for you because this place on the backside of the desert, being a shepherd, alone with God, this is the place that I'm choosing as my provision to prepare you and train you and equip you and humble you so that you can ultimately become the man that I can use and ultimately bless. You starting to get the picture? God had provided all this, and God is faithful. So Moses... He becomes content to settle down. Forty years, backside of the desert, the land of Midian. It's God's chosen place of preparation for service. What's God's chosen place for you? What's your circumstances? Are you grumbling and griping and mad at God or frustrated or discouraged at your circumstances today? Are you going to continue to turn your circumstances into a negative in your life? Or are you going to realize that this is God's place to train me? And if I humble myself and accept it and trust him and execute his plan, which is learn his word and grow and apply it to my life, I will ultimately be blessed. I'm going to give you a principle. Don't miss this. Put a principle up on the board. And here it is. God uses prepared people. Do you understand that? Now, can God use anybody at any time? Of course he can. He could use any of us any time. I mean, he used uh, Balaam's ass, a donkey, to speak, right? He 
He could use anybody at any time, no matter what your level of spiritual growth is. But the greatest effectiveness in our service comes after we've grown and learned something and been prepared and equipped. Do you understand? People today, when they hire people, they're always saying, you know, five years experience wanted or required. You follow what I'm saying? They, they want people that are prepared, right? God doesn't do a lot of on-the-job training. God sees way ahead, and he prepares somebody for what he has what? To accomplish. So God uses prepared people. But here's the thing. And God chooses the time and place of service, and he also chooses what? The, the time and the place of preparation. And God may choose some very humbling circumstances for your life. God may choose to, you know, you have an aspiration, you, you want to, to meet a Christian man or a Christian woman and have a family. You may want a career. Uh, you know, you want to serve the Lord. You, you got all these uh, ideas and desires of what you would like your life to be. And you know what, God says, yeah, but you know, to prepare you for what I have for you, I got a man for you, I got a woman for you, I got a nice job for you, for your career, and I also got a ministry that I want you to perform for me. But guess what? Right now, I'm going to make you single, and you're going to have to learn how to handle singleness and walk with me and learn my ways and be faithful in your singleness to continue to seek me and grow and then... In my time, I'll promote you and bless you to where I want you to be. You starting to get the picture here? See, God chooses the time and place of our service. He also chooses the time and place of our preparation. You starting to get the picture? Now, what God may choose for us may not be what we would have chosen for ourselves. I know when I was being prepared to be a pastor, I did not like the place that God chose for me. I had gone through a, a terrible divorce. I, uh, I was a, a single father. I was working a dead-end job that a friend of mine had given me in, in, a, in a Ronzio pizza place, okay? That's after having been in a family business where I, you know, I, I ran my own business. And I lived in a, a little basement apartment. And uh, at the end of the week, I was lucky if I had $10 left over to get a pizza and a movie. You could do that in those days. I don't think you'd get a pizza and a movie for 10 bucks nowadays, right? And that's not going to happen, right? <laughs> Maybe you get a slice of pizza. I don't know. But, but the point was, and you know what? And it seemed like it went on and on and on. And I didn't like it. It was humbling. Okay? But it was the place that God chose. And you know what I did in that time that I had? I had a lot of time alone. I had a lot of time alone in that little apartment. And you know what I did? I got some tapes from a good teacher and I listened. Opened up my Bible and I read it. Got books on theology and I studied it. And I wrote in my Bible, I will prepare myself. And when my time comes, I'll be ready. And many years went by because I took a few detours too, okay? I'll, I'll confess that. I wasn't always on the straight, narrow like I should have been. But God, he, he just get, kept, he never quit on me. But what I'm trying to say to you is, I, that's not what I would have chosen for myself. But I came to the point where I just resigned myself to the fact that, guess what? I've been through failure. I went through a divorce, the pain of that. You know, the heartache of it, or, the confusion about the future, financial difficulties, living in, in, in a little apartment in the basement, you know, having to depend on the family to help me out. And it was, it was humbling and, and tough and difficult. It wasn't what I would have chosen, but it was in that place that God trained me and taught me his word and equipped me and taught me how to walk by faith. And to trust him. And then the time came when God what? Promoted me. And I feel like the best promotions are still ahead. I don't think he's done with me yet. I want more. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can what? Ask or think. 
But we've got to learn to accept that what is the place that's God's provision for my growth and preparation? It might be humbling, but I'll accept it. And I'll seek him and be faithful because I know he's going to be faithful to me even when I'm not faithful to him. Are you with me? But listen, listen, God uses prepared people, folks. Uh, and you've got to notice something else. He chooses the time and place of his service. The nation Israel, <coughs> when Moses wanted to deliver Israel, it wasn't God's time. Moses tried to do it in his own strength, in his own power, in his own time. But you also got to realize the nation Israel wasn't ready because it was the Hebrew who told Moses, oh, what are you going to do, kill us like you did the Egyptian? They didn't recognize that he was the chosen deliverer. They weren't ready to be delivered. Forty more years would have to pass before the nation was ready. Forty years had to pass before Moses was ready. The next generation would be prepared by God. And during that time, God prepared who? Moses. You see, God may be slow, but he's always what? Right on time. But one thing I've learned in life is God's timing is what? Perfect. You know, the Bible over and over, you read verses that say, wait patiently on the Lord. Endure patiently. Wait upon the Lord. Yea, wait upon the Lord. All over Scripture, hundreds of times you read, wait on the Lord. And I'm going to tell you something. While we're waiting, we need to humble ourselves. And just keep trusting and keep doing what he told us to do. And stay focused and occupied with Christ through the word. Because the devil is always going to come along and try to give us a shortcut out. And so many times Christians choose the shortcut. Or in frustration they go back to the world and they sublimate. Maybe they'll do some drinking or drugs or some illicit relationship. Or just absorb themselves in business and career and whatever else. And they what? Take a detour. And hopefully they recover. Many of them don't. But hopefully they recover. You've got to learn to handle this place. Because God uses prepared people. And I want you to understand this. I want to give you another point before we move on. Serving God in any capacity without preparation is difficult. Serving God in a leadership capacity without preparation is useless. And today we've got a lot of men in leadership, and God help us women pastoring churches, in leadership that have not been prepared in God's school. And all they're doing is confusing and messing up God's people. And the blind are leading the blind, and they're all falling into what? A spiritual ditch. They don't understand the grace of God and the plan of God. And they're not growing spiritually. So don't forget this. So here's Moses. Alone. And God provides him what? A place. Ruel's house. Moses must have thought over the years though. But he's spending 40 years here on the backside of the desert. And you know what? He's got a wife. And he has a few kids. And his father-in-law is a believer. Pretty good guy. Right? Took him in when he had nothing, right? And he goes out, and he's got a job to do every day. It's kind of a mundane job, you know. You ever feel that about, way about your job? It's like the guy in the commercial for Dunkin' Donuts. It's time to make the donuts. Do you ever feel that way about your job? Yeah, it gets to be a grind. But here's the thing. Yeah, every day he had to get up and take them sheep out to the backside of the desert. Right? And be alone in the sun, in the wind, in the sand, right? With God. And sure, it's a grind, but he was content to do it. He, but there must have been times where he must have thought, you know what, God must have given up on me. I mean, can you imagine as the years passed and he's out there on the side, backside of the, the side of the mountain and there's just the sheep, bah, 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 and the sand and the sun and the wind, and the scorpions, and the poisonous snakes, right? And he's alone, and he starts to, his mind starts to drift back to what? Egypt, and the palace, and the life of luxury, and pleasure that he had, 
Right? Come on, you got to think he's human, right? And he must have looked and he said, what happened? <laughs> What's become of me? How, how did I get here? But, and there must have been points where the devil said, yeah, you know what, God's forgotten about you, Moses. You are all alone in the land of Midian on the backside of the desert. God, Moses, and here's what God whispers to us in those places. And I want you to know this is a lie. God will never give up on you. Did you hear me today? Did you hear me today? I don't care where you're at, what you're going through, how you've been messing up. God will never give up on you. Do you hear me? I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I want you to hear me today. And, you know, the devil must have whispered to him, Moses, God's forgotten you. God's given up on you. But the truth is that Moses, what? Greatest days were ahead of him. Wow. That out of a miserable failure and the mundane grind of life, God was equipping him for his best life. The greatest days of Moses were what? Ahead. And Moses was able to get there because Moses became content to accept it and to continue to trust God, to fight off the doubts. Because he knew God had what? Chosen him. The last part of Moses' life was his greatest days. This is exciting. Because this tells you that no matter where you're at, no matter how you failed, that if you just accept God's grace provision and God's place of training and preparation, that your best life is what? Ahead of you. Do you understand what I'm talking about this morning? But the thing is, it's not going to come as quickly as you want it to come. Yeah. Notice you don't get a quick amen on that one. When you tell people they got to wait for this and do the right thing while they're waiting, you, you don't get amen. Because you know what it's about us human beings? We want what we want when we want it, right? We don't want to wait for it. But there's good reasons to wait. God has reasons. And there's a process of time that's necessary to change us. To fundamentally change us at the what? Very core of who we are. And that takes time. Emotion says, oh yeah, I got it, Lord. I figured it out. I'm good now. And God says, no, you ain't. There's more time because that's just emotion talking. And even though at the moment you mean it, you don't know yourself as good as I know you, God says. And I know that once things get better, you'll be right back to your old what? Ways. Maybe not so deep but you'll still, you'll slip back. So we got to completely deal with whatever the issues are in you that bring you to this place of what? Failure. So that you can put it behind you and move forward. Now, I want to say this. It's never too late for God to use you. Wow. Isn't that awesome? If you will humble yourself, and if you will get right with God, if you will accept the place that he's placed you as the training ground and the preparation to learn his ways and to humble you and prepare you for what he has for you, then your best days are ahead. Moses had 40 years in the palace and got the worldly education than 40 years on the backside of the desert getting God's BD degree, right? God's training. And then he had 40 fantastic years serving God, leading the nation Israel as their deliverer. For Moses, the end was better than the beginning. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7, 8. I didn't put it in the notes, but I want to go there. I got 10 minutes. Don't let me lose you. Ecclesiastes 7, look at this. I want you to see this. For Moses, the end was better than the beginning. And it should be, right? You know, if we're growing as Christians, you know the greatest impact and effectiveness of our life should be the last third of our life, right? Really. 
when you, when you think about it, you know, uh, if, you get sa- if you got saved young, you know, you still got all that youthful vigor and zeal and fleshliness. And it's all going to be what? Trained out of you. Right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then you, you need that place of preparation. But, you know, the, the great news is, listen, if we humble ourselves, accept the place that God has placed us, learn the lessons that we're supposed to, the end is going to be better than the beginning. Look at verse number 8, Ecclesiastes 7. It says, better is the end of a thing than the beginning, what? Thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the what? Proud in spirit. See how important patience is? The Bible tells us that the end of a thing is going to be what? Better than the beginning. Right? Why? Because God's working it. But, are we, here's the big question this morning, and only you can answer this in your life, and only you are answering it now, and only you will answer it in the future. Are you willing to patiently wait on God and execute his plan while he finishes the work in you that he needs to do to prepare you for what he has prepared for you? Or will you become proud and rebellious and fail to execute his plan and miss out on that opportunity. Saved by his grace, thankfully, but saved as by what? Fire. Will you be willing? I'm going to tell you something. You may be in a tough place today, and are you going to go out and make the same old stupid decisions that you've always made to get yourself out of it? Are you going to try to rely on your flesh and your own schemes and your own strength to rectify the circumstance or are you going to get into God's word get into a good church where doctrine is taught don't play games with God in one of these fluffy silly churches there's a lot of silly fluffy churches out there that ain't going to help you grow they'll get you all emotionally charged but they're not going to help you grow spiritually and I don't say that to condemn other Christians I just am I your enemy because I tell you the truth you got to get into the word and you got to be taught the word by a prepared pastor This is very important. But if you will learn his word and grow and accept the circumstances and patiently trust God and execute his plan and do the right thing today, tomorrow, the next day, with the hope and the confidence that God says he'll never leave me and he works all things out for good and he is what? Faithful. With that confidence, you'll get there, brother. You'll get there, sister. Do you hear me? But it takes some what? Patience. And it takes the humbling of our pride. Now, you know, some folks, I think, are going to have their best years ahead of them. Best days are ahead of them. Because they're willing to accept where God places them and to patiently trust him. I want to give you a, a couple of verses and then we'll close here today. And here's a principle I want you to look at. And I, I want you to see this principle. And we've got five minutes. Don't let me lose you. Here's a principle we want to put up on the board. Simple, but powerful. God's grace will never let the believer go. You know what that means? God's never going to quit on you. On the backside of the desert, Moses must have thought at certain times God's forgotten me God can't use me anymore God can't bless me anymore I blew it was that the truth no again I like what Dr. Lewis Berry Schaefer used to say in God's grace the bird with the broken wing can be healed and fly higher than he or she ever flew before wow see that in God's what? Grace. And, and make sure you understand that it's all of grace. It's all of grace. We stand in the grace of God. And I, I want to show you a verse, a, a scripture, if you will. Uh, let me just take you to Genesis chapter 28, because I don't have a lot of time here. But I want to tie this together for you before we leave this morning. Genesis chapter 28. 
And I just want to leave you with this and set this circumstance up for you. And, the, and the, I want to look at verse number 15, but here's the thing I want you to understand. Jacob had messed up his life. He had stole the birthright. He had stole the blessing from his brother. His brother actually wanted to what? Esau wanted to kill him. Right? Now he had a, he listened to his mother and her scheme and he shouldn't have. But it was his own what? Lust for advancement. And uh, Jacob was now reaping what he sows and he was going to have to leave home and he was a mama's boy. And he was going to have to go to an uncertain future over at Uncle Laban's house. And he would meet Uncle Laban, and Uncle Laban is going to... Uncle Laban is 20 times the schemer and scammer that, what, Jacob is, and Jacob's going to get some of his own medicine there, right? He's going to learn the hard way. And now he's going out to this uncertain future all alone, leaving behind all the comfort and security and love of his home. And he must have thought, wow, I really, what, blew it. I really messed up. God, God can't do anything with me anymore. You know, who's that talking? That's the devil, right? That's the devil. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Their sins and iniquities I remember no more. Look at verse number 15. And God comes, Jacob is all alone, okay? He's sleeping on stones. Imagine having a stone for your pillow. Boy, life got tough. See, no matter, I mean, I think for most of us, no, no matter how bad it gets, we, 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 we can't say that I had a stone for my pillow. Right? Right? He's got a stone for his pillow to rest his head. But look at verse 15. And God comes to him. Okay? And he says, and behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. God comes to him at his lowest point in life, where he's discouraged, where he's fearful, where he has an uncertain future, where he's messed up and is probably thinking, I blew it so bad, God's never going to be able to do anything for me. And God comes and he says, listen, let me tell you something. You might have a stone for a pillar tonight, but I'm going to tell you something, Jacob. I'm not done with you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I remember one day as a young man, I told you, I went through this divorce, and I was in a legalistic church at the time, and, and uh, you know, it was all about emotion and, and rules, and they didn't know nothing about God's grace, and, it was, it was, and, and I was confused, because now that I had messed up and been through a divorce, I was like, well, there's no way I could ever be a pastor now, you know, and there's no way that God could use me now, and here I am living in a little basement apartment with no money in my pocket. No future, no options, no opportunity, just a Bible. And some tapes from a man who knew God's word, Colonel Robert Thiem. You know, controversial figure, but let me tell you something. He had some great truth, okay? And uh, that was where God wanted me. <laughs> and I started studying, you know? And I started studying. And I remember one day I went... And went out on my front steps in my, my house that I used to live in, and it was a nice sunny day. It wasn't like today. It was warm. It was like 75. It was a beautiful day. You know, one of those days, it's just, you hear the birds chirp, and I sat on the front steps, and I just, I was sitting there so discouraged, and I said, Lord, everything that I wanted for my life, it's, it's like it's all been taken. It, it, what can I, where am I going to go from here? You know, nobody wants a divorced preacher. The legalistic church I was in, oh no, that was like you were a third class Christian, if you were a Christian at all, you know? And, uh, and I didn't, you know, I started to study a little bit about God's grace at that time. If 
from uh, Dr. Lewis Perry Schaefer too. And uh, I, I just, and, and listen, this is not something you should do, but it would just happens once in a while. I just sat there with my old school field Bible, right? And I just happened to open the Bible as I'm sitting there so down and so discouraged, and I turned to Isaiah chapter 30, verse number 18, and I looked down, and I don't recommend doing this, but sometimes these things happen. They just happen. You don't plan it, it happens. And I read, and therefore will the Lord wait that he might be gracious unto you. And it was like the whole world turned at that moment. And I got a little book called Christian at Ease from R.B. Thien, and he expounded on that verse a few days later. And what I understood now was that God was waiting for me to grow up into the person that he needed me to be, that he could promote me to something what better, and that in his grace he had not what? Given up on me. And I know what Jacob felt like. The whole future was uncertain. There was no options. All I felt was discouragement and shame and failure. And God came to me. And he said, therefore will the Lord wait that he might be what? Gracious unto you. And I said, wow, so there's hope. <laughs> God hasn't given up on me. All this failure, all this mess, it's just what? Part of the process. And if I trust him and grow and learn his word and accept that this is where he's placed me now as my place to be what? Trained and I learned more Bible in that basement apartment alone with no money in my pocket than I've ever learned since. It was God's place of preparation. God comes to Jacob and says, look, things are bad now. The future's uncertain. You're discouraged, but I want you to know I'm not going to quit on you until I bring you back into this land and fulfill every promise that I made to you. That's for you, folks. That's for you. That's your God. He's on your side. He'll never quit on you. No matter where you're at, it's going to take some patience, and it's going to take doing the right thing, right? When, when the devil's telling you, don't do the right thing, right? But if you will persevere, God has something great for you. Oh, that's good. That was better. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we're grateful and thankful this morning to be able to have had this time to know and to study these things from your word. And I do pray this morning that you would challenge our hearts to take these principles and apply them to our lives, that we might continue to grow and fulfill your plan and purpose. And we pray for anyone this morning that's not saved. Father, we pray, if you're here today or if you're within the sound of my voice, and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Right now in the privacy of your own heart and your own mind, you can tell God, I know that I'm a sinner, but I do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who died for my sins and rose again. And Lord Jesus, I'm trusting you and you alone as my Savior, my Lord. Let's take a moment of silent prayer for anyone who wishes to trust Christ. Now, Father, this morning, if your Holy Spirit has spoken to anyone's heart, my prayer is that you would give them assurance if they have believed upon the Lord Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that you would reveal your love to them in a special way. 
And I ask that you lead them back to study your word, that they might grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I ask these things in his name. Amen. Folks, let's stand and we'll sing a song. We'll bow our heads for prayer. Father, we praise you and thank you for those that give graciously, graciously from their heart. We pray, Lord, that you'd bless them. And we pray, Lord, that you provide for our needs so that we continue, we can continue to share this message of grace and love to those around us. And we ask a blessing, Lord, on all that we do, in your Son, Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen. Let's sing unto the Lord.
forget that we're going to have uh, coffee and fellowship, so hopefully you can stay uh, fellowship with us for a while. And also, parents, remember that you're going to have to sign your kids out, all right, before, before they can leave the classroom, all right? That's for their protection and safety. So go get your kids and sign them out uh, after the service is over, all righty? Okay, Brother Carl Tag, would you come and close us in prayer? Maybe bow our heads for prayer, please. Dear Lord, Father, thank you, Father, for this church, Father, and the ministry that we have. Thank you for our pastor, Father, and the messages that he delivers to help us grow. Father, my prayer is this, Lord, that you give us the health and strength to worship, serve you, Lord. Help us guide us towards your will, Father, for our lives. Bring us back here safely, Father. Watch over our children. Thank you for our prep school teachers and all those who do so much to make these services happen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Folks, God bless. Have a great day.